Hey. How you doing, brother? I'm good. How are you doing? Well, the harder we work, the luckier we get. Yeah, that's right. How you doing, man? So what's going on? Not too much. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time on a Monday night to join us. Um, oh, you know, we're, uh, we're with the International Dyslexia Association, Oregon branch. Uh, we got an award-winning filmmaker, Harvey, uh, here, and we're excited for him to tell his story. And before we get into it, you know, I wanted to share with you, Shelby, with our, with our branch, talks about the empowerment you give our students and what you do to elevate young people within the dyslexic community. And I just think that's so powerful and just wanted to share that with you before we get started here. Well, I appreciate it, but you know, I was like thinking about this and uh, my guy, I'm dyslexic. I don't even know how you guys are talking anymore, you know? <laughs> really? It, it, it is a challenge, isn't it? With social media and all that it, stuff. But brother, here's the thing. It's like, you know, there's um, like you guys are carrying the torch, you know, and and um, now we got some momentum happening. I mean, all the stuff that, that you young guys are doing, you really are making an incredible difference. And, and what we learn, you know, what we all it's kind of like, like, you know, we, we can't call it dys dyslexic mafia because it has bad names, but a dyslexic tribe. You think about older and younger people yeah. and how we all learn and we pass the information on. So it's really important what you're doing. But but I know you're interviewing me, but I have some questions for you, brother. <laughs> well, we can get to it. I love, you know, on that note, though, like, I think it is so important that we, we give credit to the people that have blazed this trail before us and for the, for the, the generations that have worked on it like yourself who've created films around this uh topic that that's given us all opportunity and, and hope on a on a totally different level that that we couldn't do without without that so i think it we need to acknowledge that as well well thank you brother yeah. what so let's let's start with you like what when did dyslexia like come into play for you can you share that like when yeah 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 no uh, i'd be happy to I was uh, born dyslexic, and I'm uh, planning on retiring dyslexic. Okay. <laughs> uh, when did you know when you were diagnosed, or like? Oh, sure do. <laughs> I mean, but I could go. I could do some really old school stuff that you like. Like I was diagnosed in 1967, and Roger Saunders was the president of the IDA back in those days. It was called the Orton Society. Okay. And uh, and the thing is. It's almost like I'm speaking another language. Well, certainly it was to our parents, to our educators. They didn't know what dyslexia was. That means, oh, you, you see things backwards. Right. <laughs> Which, Jared, my brother, you don't see things backwards, do you? No, it's not so, a visual. This is what we're kind of like trying to teach people. Of The fact is we don't see things backwards. We're kind of like, everybody else except we see things maybe differently i mean it's interesting people have really taken me aside and said you know how do you how do you see these letters it's like i see them the same way you guys see them but i think what happened in the last you know 50 years like i'm 61 years old you do the math yeah. <laughs> so first grade second grade third grade they can't. They couldn't identify people in those days. The thing about what you got with your audience now, besides the young kids you have working, but the parents that are here, they can identify kids in kindergarten now. Is that That's a right. kindergarten? Kind kindergarten. How do you say that? Yeah, kindergarten. You got it. Kindergarten. So you can identify it. So we can do early remediation. But wait, my favorite part. My favorite part that Diana King taught me is like. We're not going to damage anybody's self-esteem now. That's right. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, the biggest crutch, right? Like, I mean, I I go back to myself when they didn't, re I mean, and you obviously, they didn't know that was the biggest hurdle is like, I felt dumb and stupid in the classroom. Yeah, I don't but, know if that, I don't know if that was true for you, but. No, of course we, they, they make us feel dumb and stupid, but mm. they're scared and they don't know what's, what's going on so here's the thing 
Jared, one of the things that we have to talk about that's really important, and you have an audience and you can talk to people, some really important things are like what our superpowers are. Yeah. And so every one of us, see, one of the things about being dyslexic, I don't know if I'm going too fast. No, you're good. But what I think is there's empathy. I, I get calls from from parents and you know advocates, moms who really care about their kids. And uh, they're concerned, they think it's like a death sentence. You hear this thing, dyslexia, my kid has dyslexia, it's terrible. But when you know, guys like you and I, and like, you know, we're embracing our dyslexia, but we've, because we felt dumb at the time, but maybe now we see things differently. Right. And you're, hey, how old are you, brother? I'm 38. You're 38. But you're working with Jake Sussman, right? I'm going to talk uh, to you. Yeah, Jake. Jake's awesome. Uh, he actually he texted me. He mentioned you today as a as a uh, an important mentor in his life today. So I thought that was really cool. Really? Yeah. Jake is dyslexic. I'm a tormentor of Jake's. That's so awesome. No, I'm a tormentor, not a mentor. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that whole English language thing. What they do to us, you know? Right. All right. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think what's important that you have going on here is you can get messages out to young people and you get messages out to parents who realize it's not a death sentence. And as soon as they realize that their kids have a pretty good potential of being okay and succeeding and actually seeing things differently could actually give them instead of a disadvantage an advantage but you know i mean we have to know what our superpowers are right and how to identify that i mean so do you have any insight on that or can you share like maybe when you kind of felt like when you started to figure out like what where your strengths were well you know, I guess what we're talking about when you're talking about us as individuals, I mean, you and I are two guys talking right now. You're looks like you're the only guy in the room. I'm the only guy in the room. We're like individuals. But when you talk about your strength, you're like a kid. And um, your mom and dad tell you what time to go to bed, tell you to wake up, remind you to brush your teeth. You know, they help you get ready for school and all those important, <laughs> right? Right, absolutely, 100%. So, so those are the people who are advocates for other people in our tribe. And they're scared and, and they don't, they don't, they're like a little nervous, but if they, if they were just calm and they just thought, oh my, oh my, my kid's dyslexic, but if they stop and thinking like, wait, but Jared's really good at this, and Jared's really good at that, and Harvey can do this. See, my insight is that our families our moms, our dads, our grandparents, our our uncles, our aunts, our brothers, our sisters, our best friends, they know what our superpowers are, maybe before we do. And the reason I say that is I've been interviewing people for many years now on this. And I asked that question and I, best friends and brothers and sisters and parents can tell you what they're good at. So Jared, what were you good at before school, before kindergarten and first grade and second grade, before you, before you became a failure in life, <laughs> what were you successful in? Well, it's a good question. I, I don't know. Like, I couldn't really tell you, like, before before school, I, I could tell you what I enjoyed doing. I mean, I enjoyed playing sports. Like, I, I just loved running around and playing. So that was, that was my big thing. But, but you loved running around and playing. But at the last IDA, what did you do? I did a marathon on the treadmill. You ran around and played. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, still doing it. <laughs> so, but but that's your power, and you can just think of all the things that you can teach people about physical activity and about life, and all those things. And you're like a rock star in that stuff, and that's the kind of stuff that we have to look at these young people who I, I, I want to talk about schools in a minute, but we know that there's a different wiring. We know there's a different wiring with the way that this brain is laid out and they're all unique. We're, you know, we're talking about that, you know, each dyslexic has unique abilities, but that's one of the things when parents, first figure this out if they stop and they think about somebody in their family because we know it's a genetic thing there could be a grandparent or it could be an aunt or an uncle and they stop and they think about these people in that whole lifeline and there's some tough innings in the beginning but later when these people find their passion and they find their superpower you know, there's a reason that makes you run, Jake, in that treadmill. Yeah. There is. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. How come you ran on the – I know you're interviewing me, but I'm <laughs> – Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I missed the question. So what, what makes Jake what, – what makes you run? So for, for me, it's always about pushing those limits. I mean, I love just to see how far I can – go i mean that's i think that's the beauty of running is like you know whether it's on a treadmill and you're working the mind more than the body or whether you're out on a hundred mile course or trying to run around the world i just think it's like how do you how do you keep pushing it and so it's just that ex that level of ex exploration for me and I, yeah no, no, I just want you to, I want you to keep going, but I want, I just want to just say like, whichever teacher, you have two teachers in your life. One is your favorite teacher. And this is for all the educators, you know, and I love and respect educators an awful lot. But the terrible thing that happens in our life as we grow up as young people and, and any nation's greatest resources are kids. And then you have these educators and the people who educate are very important people in our life. But really you got to make sure that that's what you want to do. You want to change life and make the world a better place because we all have two educators in our life. to remember our best one and our worst one. <laughs> so true. So, but I don't know, I'm a filmmaker and, and you like to run on treadmills, but I would only picture you running and the next treadmill over is your worst educator. Yeah. And this, empathy comes from you know because i don't think you now jared is going to say um you know run faster run harder i think you're going to have the empathy to be able to look at that person and saying oh okay you know maybe we should just do smaller little bits right now we can build you up because i don't think they're going to outrun you i don't think your worst educator when I mean, you know that person you 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 see that person in your mind right now that person is going to run against you in a treadmill I don't think so, but you know your superpower. Right. So, like, on that note, I, I, like, when did you, when did you figure that empathy part out? Uh, that's a good question. That was different than figuring out when I had my, my dyslexia. Well, empathy is when I realized, um, well, I guess I would say, like, You know, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff. I just hang out with, like, my friends are experts. <laughs> that's like me, too. I do that, too. <laughs> well, that's, that's a compensating mechanism. Right, Jared? And it's like, well, yeah. the reason we do that is that we're smart enough to hang out with smarter people, you know? And that's, you know. Well, the empathy part, I think what happens in development and people growing up like sixth grade is a tough time for boys and girls. Mm. There's a lot going on then. 
and you're trying to fit in and and you know there's bullying going on and do you do something do you do bullying or how does it come in but when you realize and you remember what it, what it felt like when there's things that you you're not good at and what happens i think i think empathy i'm going to answer your question but i think there's another thing we're talking about here we're talking about lifelong learners yeah and we're talking about fixed mindset so if you're a fixed mindset i'm hoping when i come back in my next life i'm gonna be a fixed mindset so i don't have to learn anything anymore <laughs> Fixed mindset, like whip. Yeah, <laughs> just sit back and enjoy it. <laughs> back and enjoy it. But the, but the difference is when you're a lifelong learner and you can learn. Let's say you, like I love to read. I love to read. I got lucky enough to learn how to read, and no two dyslexics are the same. But I also learned experiential. I learned. So when my friend Jared is running, he's going to go down the road and he's going to see things and your heart's pumping and your blood's flowing. You're smelling, you're hearing things and you're turning and you're looking. My brother, my brother's learning at that time. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So. Your question is, when did you learn empathy? Hmm. You know, I mean, it's a lifelong lesson too, brother. That's you true. know, and you see it and, and the wonderful thing is to, don't, I'm, I kind of like mean people. <laughs> First of all, <laughs> towards mean people, right? It's yeah. like, well, where are they? Can't we give them a little bit of love, right? Right. So I think, you know, I think life is a classroom. And I think, I, I think mean people have been hurt at some time. Right. It open up our hearts to them. And then I'll, Jared, I hate to be like that dumb guy again, but I'm going to go back to your worst educator. What happened with that person? And why did that, that person didn't have the information that's out there now for our educators? Right. And the person did not realize that they were hurting Other my people. brother or hurting Harvey or hurting said dyslexic. So I go back to Jared on one treadmill and the other educator and the educator on the other one. How would you treat that person differently? You might at you at 15 or you at 13 or 12, you might make that person run really a lot. Right. <laughs> it's true. Good to you, but, but you as a caring, compassionate, empathetic yeah. human being, you might be able to show kindness and teach them how to achieve their goal, even if they can't. Just right. But bringing, essentially elevating that person up to the best that they can possibly be. Like that would be, if I'm running on the neck next to anybody, that's what I'd want for them. I don't, I would take, you know, that's how I see it. I, I see it like you in the, in the past is the past or how the, how they were treated or if they're mean, but that's not my responsibility with another person. That's why I was kind of asking about the empathy is like, okay, now, Knowing what I know now, how do you help elevate that person? How do you make that person the best they can possibly be and put them in a success uh, position of success? But, but you're already doing it, and you know because we we've learned. You know, we. I mean, I can. One thing I know about talking to dyslexic. Well, you know, I made a film about dyslexia. I don't know if you know that. Oh, yeah, I do know that. <laughs> and you had some uh, pretty notable people on that film. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, like, the thing is, so I'm dyslexic. And, but I don't really know what that means. And none of my teachers explained it to me. 
nobody explained it to me in 1960, whatever, <laughs> 1970, whatever. Um, so it might have been a driving force of why I made a film of like, what the heck is dyslexia? So you ask everybody, we asked man, man on the streets, you know, which is humans on the streets. And we went and found the top neuroscientists and some famous movie stars and some famous people who are celebrities. And, um, but they all said the same thing about what happened in kindergarten, first grade, second grade. They were successful at home before they came in and they failed at school. So that's kind of important that everybody, women, women, here's one of my favorite parts. Like dyslexia, dyslexia, she don't discriminate. She yes. don't care. She, she don't care if you're old or young or what your religion is or what your race is. So that's why dyslexia has been very good to me because when you meet the dyslexic tribe, when, when the parents first get a little bit nervous and then the schools are like, the kid's not trying, the kid's not doing this or that. It's like, yo, that's so old school now. Right. There's this thing called the internet and you give a two minute message, a three minute message to educators and say, look, we got to do this for Jared or Johnny or Jake or Julie or Wanda, whoever. Right. Literally, we have the information now. It's like you running next to that educator. How would you do it now? You have enough information. You're going to just ask your not favorite educator, what do you want out of running on this treadmill to beat you? And you're going to go, you could run for 11 miles. You could run for 111 miles for all I know with you. <laughs> but do they want to run a mile? Do they want to run a tenth of a mile? Right. And it's a, it's a beginning. And it's like, it's like teaching at the level that they're at. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm clear on that, but I think you kind of know where I'm going. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think you talk, you're talking about it like in such a, positive way of bringing people along in this journey whether it's running whether it's educating whether it's filmmaking it's if people have a desire to do something you know whether they're dyslexic or other or educator it's how do we continue to bring those people along and i think just the understanding of, of that principle alone is really powerful i think you're already doing it I mean, I think you know it. I think it's the empathy that we were talking about before. Yeah. I think self-esteem. And, um, and remember, there's also the best teacher you've ever met. Now, I'm not talking about your parents. I'm not talking about where they came in because they grow with you. But you have a certain teacher that recognizes a certain thing in you. And so when I say your best educators and your worst educators, you know, let's give as much equal time to those really good educators and what they're able to see. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, I won an Emmy for writing, which is really, it's like an inside joke because dyslexic. But, but Billy Bob Thornton, my friend Billy Bob Thornton, won an Academy Award for writing, which is, gets even better. He won, he won an Academy Award for writing and he's dyslexic. And you can see in, in our film, Dyslexia, that when he writes, the people who, trans he writes with pencil, and people have to translate it, but he writes with a dialogue from people who live in the country who don't use perfect English. And he goes, and almost a direct quote, he says, I meant to say that, I didn't mean to say that, I meant to say that, not that, not that. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. how he writes, how he hears, how he observes. It's almost, again, to you running down the road, you seeing things, and you absorbing and learning. However it gets into your head, it's A-OK. -okay. Your best teacher knew that. Your mom and dad, you know, 
you know, your, your family, hopefully they recognize that and they knew that you're going to be okay. Yeah, no, definitely fortunate to come from a, a supportive tribe. Uh, and I like, I like that word tribe. Um, but yeah, very fortunate to have that. I was going to ask you, so on, the, cause I, cause I know you're an award-winning uh, filmmaker and uh, now Emmy writer. When you write, do you, do you write with the idea in mind that the award is, is part of the journey or are you so engulfed in the process that the award becomes that, that just simple byproduct? That's a funny question. I mean, no, I annoy people. I write with people who can spell better than me. <laughs> you know? Like, I just annoy people all the time. It's like, no, we're just like, I mean, you don't run saying that you're going to run faster or better than anyone else, but you improve your personal score sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, what you and I are doing is just sharing I mean, I like what you said about positive ideas, especially in this day and age when there's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm the best worst storyteller ever. And uh, so you asked me, do I start off on something like that? No, I just think we're all supposed to do the right thing. Mm. And we're living in a really not nice time now with red states and blue states. Uh, it's just trying to figure out where that came from. I did figure it out, but it's not in the Constitution that it's going to be red states or blue states. There's nothing about Fox or CNN or the Republicans and the Democrats on these things. I know there's, there is that we can have different party systems in there, but to vilify each other if people are trying to help each other and do stuff, I just believe that we're here to do the best job we can do. I love that. But then I think about people who might not have, who might not have the empathy that you have, or, or people who have suffered and gone through stuff. And it's a whole different world. And, if, and then if their self-esteem isn't as good, then they can become mean. And that's why we have to be nice to mean people. Be nice to mean people. Does that make sense? Yeah. To oh, I, I think it makes, I think it's brilliant. I think because when you look at mean people, I, I, the vision I have is, is people that have been hurt. And I just want to open my heart to that. You know, I mean, it's, it's all about if you can repair the hurt and help people heal, what opportunity do we have now? I I have another one for you, Jared. Since we're like a couple of guys talking, what if somebody's worst teacher could be somebody else's best teacher? Wait, hold on, Jared. Oh, look at me. You know, I'm Harvey. I'm the dumbest guy in the world. I, I uh, this is like almost like something that my parents would have done to me, except I figured it out on my own. I have my key like strapped. Anybody who like knows me from the IDA and stuff, I have my keys just strapped on my vest at all times. Right. That's brilliant. So, so I can find him that way, but, <laughs> right. but, um, so I have a key. Everybody knows I say this all the time. I have a key. You have a key, you know, you have a car, you have a house or an apartment, you know, I have a house or an apartment. I have a car. So if I took my key and gave it to you next time I saw you and, and you give me your key, if I go out to my car and I take your keys and I try to start it and it doesn't start it, do I say my car is stupid and dumb and I kick it and I tell my car it's so start it's so dumb because it so <laughs> it these educators and by the educators I'm not saying teachers on that I'm saying educators I'm saying the school superintendents you know I I get in a lot of trouble I'm 61 so I you know. Board of Education, the school superintendents, the, the principals, the policymakers, that's right, the people we elect, you know, there's some really good ones out there that really want to become the educational candidate and, and people who get there who really want to understand the latest 
information coming out of Haskins or Yale or they really want to study the study what the studiers have done. And, uh, you know, why won't I be optimistic when there's that much information out there yeah. where the parents have this thing called like the World Wide web, all the kids are using it now. And you can look it up and you can figure out, you can, people will look you and I up in a couple of days. And, uh, and you know, the, the thing is, you're just talking about your experience, I'm talking about my experience. And, you know, we didn't talk about how we learned to read or how we overcame certain things or what our compensation mechanisms are. And there are many of those, of those things, but the thing is that it's a positive world. We live in a positive world. You want to see a negative world? It'll be negative if you want it to be negative. If you want it to be positive, it's going to be positive. So true. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's as simplistic as it sounds sometimes to hear that. I think it's so true. And, and I think even more so this empathy thing, it plays to the people that are in the system that are, that are teaching, that are, that are the student superintendents that are, that are in that. If we can give them some <laughs> perspective. Well, perspective is an interesting thing. And like, and that's what they're really, really, they need a lot of different, you know, if they were trained to do something in school, in the university, I mean, it, it's hard. I'm going to go back to you running down the road and you using all of your senses, not just told what it's like. When you're running, you can run on the treadmill and you can go run as you travel around the world or the country or the state. Wherever you go, you're going to see something. If you run around your neighborhood, you're going to see one thing. But I bet you you're going to learn something new when you're running around it. The same neighborhood, you're still going to learn. But then if you go from here to, hey, who doesn't love the IDA? We get to go to a different state every year, meet different people, have different experiences. Um, but we learn from what we see, you know, and, and, and we figure out how can, how can we make a difference in the world? Well, we can make a difference by telling the truth. And that brings you back to, you know, do we do it for an award? No. We do it because that's what we're supposed to do in this world. And if there was a house on fire and you're in a tribe, what are you going to do? You're going to go back in and you're going to rescue people. That's our job. So true. And you, I mean, you do that, you do that through film, but you do that, I think in your conversations and I'm, I'm guessing in other ways that, that people don't get to see. And that's, that's really special. And I know you do it for a student panel and the, the students that are part of the uh, International Dyslexia Association Oregon branch look up to you and from that, from that perspective because just blazing the trail that you did and when you talk to them, that elevation is just, you can see it on their face. Well, I hope so. Hey, I, I can, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you? you? Can, yeah, yeah, you, you got it. So what I... You know, something kind of in interesting about our our uh, mutual friend, um, Jake. So, which is really kind of what we're talking about, too. So, what do you do with Jake? Just tell me tell me a little bit about that, that organization. I don't care if we do a, a tad bit of a plug, but this is like, this is empathy, dyslexia, and running into a burning building. Am I right or wrong? What do you do? I yeah, I think you're totally right. I mean, Jake is, is awesome. He's got this superpower consulting and building a uh, mentorship program uh, with the goal of helping to reach a million kids, which I think is really cool. But it is. It is about engaging students and meeting them where they're at and helping them identify their strengths. And that's all it is. It's, you know, it's, it's not looking at them any other way than who they are as people. And then helping them, giving them the key to unlock their own strengths that they have inside. 
I think that's, that's what's really special about what he's doing. So it's the same thing we're talking about. It's the empathy. It's the superpowers. Okay, so the reason I'm, I'm saying that, and, and um, so I know the first time I met that guy. And, um, and he was at Foreman School, and he was in high school. And, um, and we were doing screenings of the sex of the movie. And so we had this distribution company and, you know, they they had this brilliant idea that we're going to just premiere in as many theaters across the country, uh, at the same time on the same night. It must've been October because for some people, everybody thinks it's the sex awareness month. <laughs> For you and me, brother, every month is dyslexic a word. <laughs> so true. So, so Helen Walden from the Foreman School. So, I, so where am I going to be? There's a bunch of different states. I live in Litchfield, and and so I went to uh, Torrington, where they played the film, and the Foreman kids show up, and they got their jackets, and they got their white shirts, and they got their ties on. And he came and he gave me like this incredible, great handshake, looked me in the eye. And yeah, I mean, I still remember that. I know. And, you know, we've we've known each other through a lot of different situations since then. But so for all the moms that are out there that are raising their young kids is to give them the self-esteem and to let them know that their kids have a superpower. It might not be spelling or reading or comprehension. And that could be for a, a bunch of reasons. One, how the kid's wired. Two, how the school's wired. You know, and the thing is for the, the parents and the, and the kids, they got to figure out what they're doing. Can they help? The school system can they help the state? That's why, yo yo yo, brother, a big shout out to decoding dyslexia. Yeah, a bunch of moms who are in every state, and there, you know, there's not a lot of cash pulling in that world. These yeah. are these are the people who were are advocates out of love and out of energy. And those are the guys who are changing the laws. So, I mean, it brings it back to love. Love is a powerful, good force. And I think that's why you and I are talking about positive stuff. It's like, we could get angry. You know, totally. we're successful, anyhow, you and I, because a lot of people who didn't learn to read, and I don't know how much you read or don't, um, we know the statistics of what happened to them in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, high school. Yeah, it gets pretty dark at that point. Well, that's why an advocate, a parent, an educator, a relative, a fellow dyslexic, people who can reach out. That's why what you're doing right now, brother, is so important. You're helping out. Uh, you're giving the avenue for people to be able to look this up if they're listening today or they're going to listen tomorrow or the next day. That you make a difference. But the question is, why do you make a difference? It's the empathy. Totally. I mean, I think it, yeah, it boils down to that, right? That empathy and love. It's not a bad, it's, they're not bad combinations. No, they're not. <laughs> There's a lot worse things out there. <laughs> okay, ask me some more questions. What am I supposed to? Yeah, so, I, well, I have, I have one that, what would you like parents and teachers, or uh, let's, let's use the educators. So what would you like parents and educators to know? Well, I, I really like that because we're actually making a film about that, and it's called Hope Film. I'm the dumbest guy in the world, and uh, but I hang out with really smart people. So, and I'm the best worst storyteller. So, and um, 
so you notice I probably didn't answer all your questions too directly today, but <laughs> but so the bottom line is, but I eventually get to them, right? Yeah, you do. <laughs> so um, so now I don't know. I know a little bit about you, not a lot about you. Um, so I don't know how you comprehend, how you read, how you take your information in. Um, uh, but we talked earlier when we first got on here, we're like dyslexic, you know, we're dyslexic, we're dyslexic, you know, if, if, if you and I can't, like, we should probably leave singing, but if you can't sing, you'd be dysmusica. <laughs> yeah. So it seemed not to care about that as much as dyslexia. So, I got to thinking, you know, we're, we do a lot of educational, films. mostly we're doing stuff on, on holistic health and food and, and the importance of, you know, people having a good, healthy life and, you know, eating well and growing their food and stuff. I got to thinking that there's this thing, you know, called reading, which we've been talking about. And how do people learn to read? Not just the dyslexic folk, but the general ed folk, the general population. Well, it's kind of a code. Remember, we talked about this earlier, that when you're in pre, pre-K, pre you know, mom and dad and everybody says, you're really great, you're doing great. And then you start learning those letters, those squiggly lines. You know, before dyslexia was dyslexia, it was called strephosymbola. It was called um, mixed up letters, right? Right. So, right so, so, but people get it. A certain percentage of people get it. 20% of the population one way or another, you can call it 20%. Don't get it so much that way, but they can teach us and we can still get it. But the rest of the population gets it. So I figured out how do they get it? I got to thinking, Jared, like, this is the film Hopeville. We're making this film. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I said to my friend Margie Gillis, she's down, you know, she grew up with Isabel Lieberman down at, at Haskins and down at Yale. And, um, uh, so I said, Margie, how do people learn how to read? They go to kindergarten and first grade and second grade. Remember, I'm the dumbest guy in the world. I just hang out with smart people. And she said, well, you got to go to Waterbury, Connecticut. They're doing it right. There's 110,000 people in Waterbury, Connecticut. And they speak 60 languages in their country. In their country. <laughs> in their country of Waterbury. Uh, <laughs> in their town. 60 languages. And uh, so I was thinking about the first grade teachers and the kindergarten teachers there. It's like, and it's like, wow, these people transform us. I mean, they're as cool as the bus drivers. Right. Here to there. But at the end of your year, you really, you know how to read or something. Now, the cool thing about what parents and educators need to know, because we're all in this together. Yeah, because you want to be a lifelong learner. You could be a fixed mindset. I learned everything I need to know in kindergarten. <laughs> Pretty much done now. <laughs> I know everything as a as a sophomore in high school. Wise fool. I love that word. Wise fool. Sophomore. So here we go. We go to Waterbury, Connecticut. They have a couple districts, and they have a district called Hopeville. Wow. I know, I don't know a lot about you, Jared, but I know one thing. I know that you're a good man, but you might not have chose to have to go through all of that suffering or whatever happened to you in early education. It would have been nice if your educators knew it, if your parents knew it. So we got another bite at the apple on being able to tell the Hopeville story. You know, I think the thing about about education is there's new information coming in all the time, but you have to be able to take it and give it to, you know, what we know is a good building block and a good foundation, but take the new stuff. And that's why important conferences like the IDA where older teachers and younger teachers get together, you get to have conferences, you get to learn. So I think when I was a kid, my long 
story of, of to answer your question about parents and educators. When I was a good kid, I heard parents complaining about they were complaining about teachers, not educators. They were complaining about teachers. And it was like the teacher's responsibility. But then I heard teachers complaining about parents. It's the parents' responsibility. So I guess this next film is like, where do we all fit in? Right. I mean, it's really back to the tribe, not just the dyslexic tribe, but the lifelong learner tribe. Yeah. It's, the lifelong learners are mostly kids at the time, but the lifelong learners could be educators who can pick up new information. The lifelong learners can be parents and educators. And, and as we go forward, it's like, I mean, I think it's our duty and our responsibility to try to get, do the best we can. Trying to get, try to get smarter every day. I reckon. Right. Bringing them all together. Bringing them all together. So, did did I answer your question? Or did I... Yeah, yeah, you did. And I and I think it's, yeah, I think there's something I always say. I say the secret sauce is parents, educators, students, all coming together, which you like totally touch on. And I was like, so I was I was relating this i had that visual as you were as you were expressing your thought there dude that's our film that's hopeful you know, oh, i can't i can't wait it's gonna be good um we have another film after that called um and for anybody who knows dinah king um you know we, and you know when dinah who was a good friend of mine uh passed away and you know she's life there's a lifelong learner and a lifelong teacher and uh, so we're making a film called Good to be King as well. So cool. It's about the life of her and how we could all teach and do stuff. I mean, the majority of what we do is, is you know, we want to teach educational health practices. And we teach an awful lot of stuff about regenerative farming and, and eating good food and doing all kinds of great stuff. And in, in the time of pandemics where... There's distant learning. It's like, oh, wow, we're really radical. We're having kids put their hands in the dirt again. You know, learning about health and nutrition, you know. Um, we're not saying you're not going to learn how to, you know, read your seed package. You know, we're going right. to, you, you know, what to do and how to do this. And one of the things we know about successful, famous dyslexics. And I, I don't mean like, you know, like a household name, famous dyslexic, but somebody who becomes a veterinarian or an engineer or somebody who learns their one field. Once they, they grasp their learning and they start absorbing the information and they start learning all about paleontology or they start learning about, you know, any number of these things. Can I, wait a minute, I have to bore you with one more story. No, you're not boring me at all. So go, please. <laughs> years ago, years ago, when I was interviewing a lot of people, I started finding out a bunch of guys who, and you know, by guys, I mean, you know, males and females, people who could look underground with these computers, and they would find these large gas pockets. And the majority of them were dyslexics. They were like looking at these computer scans. They kind of looked like looking at babies in the womb. Like, what am I looking at? And these guys were all dyslexic. They'd all go to conferences. I mean, this wasn't like, they're not a bunch of dyslexics doing this. They just happened to show up. They're like underground gas finders. They're looking at the ground and say, oh no, that's a pocket of gas. The same with paleontologists, people who find stuff underground. They begin to look for stuff. They begin to look for clues. These are out of the box thinkers. We have yeah. to grow society. Yeah. We have to know how important their special abilities are. We we have to not knock them down 
self-esteem when they're young, we have to let, you know, we have to help our educators realize that these potential late bloomers are really beautiful things in the garden of life. So true. I, okay, so I have, I have two questions for you. One is, first one is, what is one of your favorite projects that you've ever worked on? I don't want to say, I don't want to put you on the spot of like saying your favorite, but like just one project that really, that you really connected with or was meaningful that you could share. Well, I think they're all. Yeah. I, mean, I think they're all really, I mean, it's like having like, if you have 11 children, you're going to say, oh, this is definitely one of my favorite. You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, right now, what we're doing right now in life and working on the farm and what we're doing and and hands-on experiential learning, I mean, you take everything that you do and, and you, you know, you build it under that, you know. Outside of that, like, I was just talking to my crew today. I'm I'm completely unemployable. Like, nobody wants to have me on their, you know, like when I was a kid growing up, I was like, so I got to work on the greatest, wonderfulest, jobs just doing i mean you know what I, I i said i'm completely unemployable then i'm telling you i'm constantly working all the time i'm like a freelancer in a little town called new york city so I do really cool stuff all the time and <sighs> and the more you do that i guess the more employable you become and uh so i don't know jared i mean uh, i love everything i'm working on or i won't be working on it does that make sense that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's so good for our audience to hear about the the connection when you do love projects or when you do love something, then it's it's abundant. And I think that's that's really powerful. Can you imagine eating what you do? I mean people yeah. people do that, but then we don't have to. People right. can I mean we don't have to. Yeah, especially with this. This this allows for... Isn't that the craziest thing? I tried one thing and I end up doing 10, 15 things before. And I'm wishing you happy birthday. Next thing I know, it's like such and such. I didn't know this was happening. I got to say this. I got to do that. Yeah. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can I, I, before you ask your second question. Yeah, go, go. Back in um, when I was a kid growing up, um, there was this like great tv show called star trek and uh, and captain kirk man you know he had this ship and i think it was in the 23rd century i don't know but he could do anything he could figure out everything he was a smart brother and so he was cruising along and um uh, and every now and then he would get bewildered he would get stuck and he would say let's ask mr spock's computer and Spock was the only guy on the ship in the 23rd century that had a computer. And he would like, stand. he's the only guy. Who was <laughs> Spock was always standing up like, like who is Spock's chiropractor? Like Spock is like standing over looking at this computer. And he's the only guy who has a computer on the ship. Now, name, name to me how many 12 year olds, you know, that don't have that iPhone or something on them that there's like, I mean, iPhone is bigger than what Houston sent, NASA sent the astronauts to the moon in, in 1969. More information on that. So it's like, we're living in this crazy age. So I don't know if it's the age of what's good for dyslexics or bad for dyslexics, or if they can afford an iPhone or not, don't know. But I know that this is the age of information. And however, our kids can absorb it. If it's running down the road, looking, absorbing, feeling, empathy. However, we need to encourage that. And we need, be it a parent or an educator. And we have to let the child, the student know how important it is to uh, to keep asking questions and, and, and to keep 
answering their questions and seeing if they're they're happy with the information that they've if they've gotten to the answer that's going to help them uh, go to the next question. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it, it does. It makes complete sense. And it's, I, it's so powerful. And I, and I know the, I know the people that are hearing that are, are feeding off of it. So uh, brings me to my, my second question. It's kind of like the last question of the night for you. I always tell my guess, you get the last word. And what message do you have to the world? I know you t- you've dropped so many golden nuggets tonight, so I'm I'm truly grateful for that. Uh, so you know, but if there was a message or a line that you you would want them to know, what would it be? Easy, man. It's love and respect, right? It's. I- It really love and respect, and and so, you know. You know, I'm honored to be talking with you, and that, you know, that you would take the time out of your day, and we could. You know, we could talk. I mean, that's. You know, so. I'm honored for that time, but. To think too about, um, like I'm kind of. Uh, so I got this daughter, and when she was like about mm, two and a half years old, there was like you know I live in Connecticut. We had some really doozy snowstorms back in the day. We still do. We get them every now and then. And uh, so I remember putting her in a snowsuit and um, taking her out to the driveway, and like 